Okay, happy-ish Monday. As you may or may not know, your Alex objectives that are could be due today or due Wednesday. I don't know how many, but several of them are going to basically leave at the end of, well, when I go back to my office after we have class. Um, we will not be finishing Chapter 5 today. We are going to get through calorimetry. There are, if you look at the Chapter 5 topics, there's basically five sections. I don't know how many sections there are. We will not get to Hess's Law and or Pizza Formations. So if you've seen those Alex objectives, because I know I've gotten some emails that are like, I, we don't know all these things. That's probably true. We will talk through one big section of that today. The other ones we will talk about two weeks from today. Right? Yes. No. You know what? I don't really know when we're going to talk about it, but the next time we have actual lecture, it's not two weeks from today. You know what? Time is hard. The next time we have lecture, lecture, we're going to talk about this. So our... Cool things. This says the SI exam review is tomorrow night. It's <clears throat> not actually an exam review. I misread her email. It is that she's going to talk about chapter five and work example problems. So if you want more practice on the stuff we've learned today, it is tomorrow from six to eight on Zoom. This QR code is for a mid-semester SI survey. If you really would prefer for them all to be online and would go, like, that's a key component here. Saying, like, oh, I'd prefer them online. And if she's, so typically on Fridays, she doesn't get very many people. Mostly because it's Friday and that's how this works. Like, just to be clear. But if it would have worked better for you due to your job schedule or something else, this is the time where you could say that. Maybe nothing will happen. But if you say something, maybe something will change. So our midterm exam goes through calorimetry, which is where we're going to stop today. It covers everything from chapters one through five. So let's, let's think about this. It'll be the whole time. So we'll come in on Wednesday and you'll get out your pen, pencil, writing implement, your calculator, and you're going to take a test. When you're done, you can leave. There's no lecture. It's, it's the whole time. So your mini exams have been 35 minutes and 100 points. Your midterm is basically too many exams at once, so it's 200 points, and you get all the minutes there are in class. Um, it is going to be cumulative, so mini exams one, two, and three, and whatever we learned today are all going to be on the mini exam, just so that we're all on the same page. Um, what questions do we have about the mini exam? If, I don't think I've talked about anything and been like, we're not getting tested. So many years I talk about stuff and I'm like, we're, this will not be on the exam. So what has previously been important is a good, like it's a good place to start. If you think back to mini exam one where it had some of those like, I don't want to call them obnoxious, but super detailed unit conversions. We teach you that as a skill building exercise so you can convert grams to moles. So it is unlikely, I mean, I haven't written this thing, so I don't actually know, but I'm relatively certain I will not be asking, um, I don't remember if you guys saw, had the question about like Molly Seidel and how fast she ran in the Olympics or Des London and her like astronomically fast, like 50K. Sorry, I watch a lot of running. Like I watched the marathon today because I'm weird, but it was great. Those types of questions are not going to be the main focus for this. This is going to be much more like use that information in something else or in different ways. Um, other questions. So I would focus on two and three and make sure that what's on one that you have seen later is present. There, I had this like great dream that I was going to make this like review worksheet <clears throat> and then and then beat Alabama, and I didn't do any work yesterday. That's, that's just how my life went. I was like, oh my God, we won. I almost didn't watch, because I was like, I don't want to watch this. It's going to be terrible. And then it was amazing, and 
That's how life rolls. Um, so I don't have anything extra other than what is already there. There are chapter worksheets. There's problems out of the back of the book. If you do not own the book, because I make it like recommended, there are copies in the library that you can like go in and look at the end of chapter problems. You can use Google. <clears throat> Figure out what that means. Um, if you look at the open access textbook, there are questions in the chapters. They're only mediocre. If you look at it and you're like, oh my God, I don't feel like we learned this. It's entirely possible that there are parts of the material that we never talked about. Particularly in chapter three, there are some different analysis types that we just don't talk about. So if you're like, this means nothing to me, either send me a picture, send me an email, I will likely write back and be like, yeah, we didn't talk about that. Or I will tell you what it is like that we did learn if it's something you should know. So you can use those. I will post a chapter five key tomorrow. So you guys can look at that. Again, the chapter five key, because we're not gonna finish it, make sure you're sticking to the ones that we already have talked about. Other questions? We have no classes coming Monday, right? Is that like weather thing? One week from today, there is no school. I will be very unavailable. Um, you mentioned before that the previous meeting pins were really useful and I've been looking over them Luckily enough, I happen to have mini exam three and they are graded and I'll post the key this evening. So yes, you may have that. The trade off with this is I do want to be clear. Usually I try to return stuff in a week, but because we don't have class next Monday and Tuesday, it is highly unlikely that your midterm exams will be graded by that day. It's possible. It would require a miracle to happen because I'm going on vacation and I'm not taking them with me. Like just so we're clear, I'm gonna leave them at home. So if I get everything done before we leave town, I will return them as soon as they are available, but more than likely you'll get it back two weeks from today. Other questions? Do your googly eyes jiggle? <laughs> I will admit that they are exceptionally distracting in this moment, but in like a joyous way, but mostly it makes me chuckle. But I was afraid you were gonna go like this and they would just start doing this. And I was like, mm, they don't jiggle as much as I would have. And I feel very uncomfortable that this is recorded and these people don't know what's happening, so. But. It's 200 points. Basically, it is too many exams stuck together. I have faith in all of your abilities. It will be awesome. Maybe. I don't know. Many of you are giving me the eyes of like, ah, I don't think so. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about calorimetry, which is 5.3. So calorimetry... As soon as I find my notes, hold please. So in chapter five, we had talked about change in energy and enthalpy and all of this information. The thing is, when we think about a reaction, we need to know how does this work? And sometimes we can create, we can measure information on smaller systems and correlate that to bigger systems. So calorimetry is the ability for us to determine the amount of heat required to change the temperature of something by one degree Kelvin or one Kelvin. So most of us are actually super familiar with the results from calorimetry because hopefully all of us consume nutrients in terms of food. When you look at the back of your Wheaties box, your mini wheats, your cinnamon toast crunch, pop whatever it is you eat for breakfast, Unless it's homemade, in which case it doesn't have nutrient facts. But at the back of that, or on the side of the box, it says, like, serving size, whatever. Here's how many calories it is. So that value is done in these types of experiments. 
So today we're going to talk about two different types of calorimetry. Coffee cup calorimetry, which is what you will do in lab, and bomb calorimetry. Bomb calorimetry is how they determine the number of calories in any given food implement. They take a small tiny bit, they blow it up, like it's called bomb because it explodes. They do this reaction and then they go on to say, then you can scale it up. So if one gram does this and it has 90 grams, you can then determine the number of calories. So that's what calorimetry is used for in like real life. Bomb calorimetry, nope, we're gonna now talk about coffee cup calorimetry, allows us to scale the information of a reaction that's on a small scale to a larger scale. It is one way that we can measure the amount of heat required for either a reaction or to change the temperature of something. So calorimetry is the, we can measure that or think about the amount of heat it takes to increase the temperature by one Kelvin of a substance can be determined using calorimetry. So it turns out that there are two types of information that we can get. We can look at C sub S, which is the specific heat capacity. And that is the amount of heat required to raise one gram by one Kelvin. And we could calculate that, so C sub S equals Q heat divided by M delta T, where in this case delta T is one Kelvin. So specific heat capacity allows us to determine the amount of heat required to raise one gram of a substance by one hundred <coughs> Kelvin. C sub M, which is the molar heat capacity is the amount of heat required to raise one mole of substance by one Kelvin. And so in this case, it's C sub M equals Q over N delta T, where N is the moles. So we have not used the, I'll call it the acronym, the symbol N for moles yet. But if you have taken intro to chem or high school to chemistry, or I don't know, any other chemistry courses, the equation PV equals NRT, for the ideal gas law, which many of you are like, oh yeah. The N here, where that stands for moles, that is the same symbol that we're using here. Alex is a big proponent of this equation because I don't tend to think about it this way. I think about the conversion between C sub S and C sub M. <coughs> but in this case, it is the amount of heat required for a whole mole of things in order to change the temperature of that. So Q is heat, we know we can read that out of the problem, we are going to mostly calculate that. M, M or N come out of the problem, and delta T. So delta T is the change in temperature in Kelvin. And so delta T is calculated T final minus T initial. So typically, we don't, when we think about temperature, I'm going to almost always give it to you in Celsius. Celsius is pretty common, so the other alternative would be Fahrenheit, which is what we use in the U.S. So when we think about delta T, if both values are in Celsius, you do not have to convert to Kelvin. Because one degree change in Celsius is equivalent to one degree change in Kelvin. If you have 5 degrees Celsius minus 3 degrees Celsius, that gives you 2. To convert that into Kelvin, it is plus 273 278 
minus 276 also gives you 2. Basically, I'm showing you this to tell you that you can calculate delta T directly from Celsius without having to convert to Kelvin. The only time it is super essential that you convert to Kelvin, one in chapter 10, but we're still in five, so that's irrelevant today. But if you are asked to calculate one of the temperature values, you're going to have to convert them to Kelvin and then back again. It's the only time <clears throat> Alex will ask you to do this. Not shocking. You'll also see it in lab, more than likely. So delta T is basically the change in temperature. Questions? So the first thing we want to think about today is, or our first example calculation, is how much heat is needed. Yeah. How much heat is needed to warm 250 grams of water from 22 to 98 degrees Celsius? So I literally just erased the specific heat capacity question where C sub F equals Q over M delta T. More often than not, we are going to solve for Q. So you could rearrange this as Q equals M C sub S delta T. And this equation is probably the more dominant calorimetry equation. Q equals M C sub S delta T. C <clears throat> sub S, the specific heat capacity, will almost always be provided in the problem. It will only not be provided if you're solving for that. So more often than not, both myself and Alex include it like blah, 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 question, 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 and then it's at the end. Like the specific heat capacity uh, is of water, 4.184. So this asks how much heat is needed to warm 250 grams of water from 22 to 98. So in this case, we are going to So we know that the mass of this is 250 degrees, nope, 250 grams. C sub F came out of the problem of 4.184 joules per gram per Kelvin. And delta T in this case is 98 minus 22, which gives us 76 Kelvin. So once we do this, we're really just going to plug it all into this calculation where Q equals. <coughs> 250 grams multiplied by 4.184 joules per gram per Kelvin multiplied by 76 Kelvin and Q equals 7.9 times 10 to the fourth joules. You could have left that as like 79000. 0, 0, 0, or you can move it into science documentation. I do not care. We all know that Alex cares. You can adjust with Alex accordingly or yell at it. Yeah. I have a question. I was doing that in Alex, and actually, when I would put in the value, like that first, they'll say something converted to kilojoules. So, in this case, it doesn't specify. I will always specify the units that I'm asking for. So, in my opinion, if it doesn't say, you could frankly put in whatever units you want. I don't want to say within reason. Reason may need to do math, figure out if you have the right answer. But Alex often asks for it in kilojoules, but the calculation starts in joules. Because the specific heat capacities are always in joules, not kilojoules. Yeah. So for most of these, sometimes it'll act like leave it in joules, sometimes it'll act. More often than not, I'll say move it into kilojoules. So, other questions about this calculation? So, part B of this question asks, what is the molar heat capacity of water? So, specific heat capacity is provided in the question. The molar heat capacity... So the conversion between C sub S to C sub M is actually really simple. So C sub M 
is C sub S multiplied by the molecular weight. And the reason we do that, if it's 4.184 joules per one gram times one degree Kelvin, so we can multiply that by 18.02 grams in one mole of water. And that gives us 75.3 joules per one mole <coughs> times one Kelvin. Or joules per mole Kelvin, which is what I tend to write out. But just trying to show that the ability to convert between the molar heat capacity and the specific heat capacity are basically just that the specific heat capacity multiplied by the molecular weight gives you the molar heat capacity using the same type of unit conversions that we've seen previously. Questions? So when you said, like, what is the molar heat capacity, like, water, we just automatically always do that, so we're just taking 18.2 grams of one molar heat flow. Well, 18.02 is the molecular weight, so that's 16 plus 2 times 1.02. So if it were to be... I'm trying to think of something else I know off the top of my head. Sodium hydroxide, which is 40 grams per mole, then you would use that conversion. But it is whatever the specific heat capacity is. Nope. Whatever the molecular weight is for the substance. So it would be impossible for you to calculate that from the specific heat capacity if they don't tell you what it is. There are other ways, because I'm pretty sure Alex has you do it to where it's like, what is the molar heat capacity <coughs> But it gives you, so the other way you could determine the molar heat capacity. Where C sub M equals Q and delta T. So you could calculate each of, and I don't have an example for this. But if we said it took, so the other way you could have done this would be your 79, 7.9 times 10 to the fourth joules where you could convert one gram, you know, you would take 250 grams, divided by 18.02, and that would give you the moles. And then you would multiply that by delta T. I think that would, it, it definitely should give you the molar heat capacity, but in Alex, they will also ask you to calculate it using this, where you have to calculate the moles, and you would do that the same way we did in chapter three. Other questions? Yeah, so the change in temperature of 5 degrees, or whatever it is, 76 degrees, is the same whether it's in Celsius or Kelvin. When we get to chapter 10, it will matter. But today in chapter 5, we can just skip right over that conversion because it won't change. Your conversion to Kelvin doesn't change the magnitude of the delta T. So I always just calculate this in Celsius and then just write it in Kelvin so that when I plug it in here, my units cancel out, which is how I confirm that I'm moving in the right direction for any of these kind of calculations. Good question. Other questions? That is a standard value. And in, in the cases, like on the next example, it's not water, but it will always be provided. Or it will say, like, for this solution, use the specific heat capacity of water or something, something, something. Any other questions? So in this case, the specific heat of octane is 2.22 joules per gram Kelvin. How many joules of heat are needed to raise the temperature of 80 grams of octane from 10 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius? Would you like to attempt this alone? <clears throat> Excellent.
thought the stretch was a question. I was like, I'm on my way, but I'll go straight down here. How's it coming? Excellent. So how many, would anyone like to share their answer or should I say what I got and you can quietly decide if you got? Okay. Yeah, what you got? That is what I got. Or 2,660, I think, is the alternative answer for that. I also have it in scientific notation in my notes. And I find exponents to be hard on the fly, so. So, on the off chance you got something else and would like to figure out how we arrived at this answer. So in this case, when we look at the problem, we can see that the mass is 80.0 grams. C sub S is provided, and that's 2.22 joules per gram Kelvin. And delta T is T final minus T initial. And that's 25 minus 10, which gives you 15 degrees Celsius. So from here, we just plug it into our <coughs> equation where Q equals M C sub S delta T. So we're going to take our 80.0 grams, multiply that by 4.18. No, we're not doing that. 2.22 joules per gram Kelvin, multiply that by 15 degrees Celsius. When we plug this in, you should get 2.66 times 10 to the third joules, or you could also have gotten 2,660 joules. What questions do we have about this calculation? So this calculation and the water calculation are what I would consider a really standard calorimetry question. It's super, I don't want to call it basic because we're about to, I don't want to say level up because that sounds a little dramatic, but we're going to start to think about something different. These types of problems are when you have a single solution, or in Alex, it'll be like, you have a solid block of iron. How much heat do you need? When you have just a single element, either in a solution or whether it's a block, this is the type of equation. But we're going to start to think about how we can determine the change in enthalpy, which is delta H, for a reaction using calorimetry. This basically is how much heat is required you could also have thought about this, so for most of us who use water bottles that are not like plastic, if they're vacuum sealed metal, it keeps your water or whatever you're drinking cold for longer. So this type of calorimetry problem would allow you to determine what the heat flow is between those. So you could use that to determine how long it would keep your drinks cold, whether that is like a liquid or Conversely, if you have a hot drink, how long will it stay hot? But the reality is, that's cool and all, but we really want to think about a reaction. So we're going to start thinking about coffee cup calorimetry. Now, today, if you go to get coffee from Starbucks, it comes in a paper cup with a plastic liner. If you go to Dunkin' Donuts, you get like a weird styrofoam cup, which is not my personal favorite, but you could get that. If you go to my house, I'm going to give you a ceramic mug, which you can put in the dishwasher. But the reality is, in the, I don't want to call it the before times, in the early 90s, it was just styrofoam cups everywhere. No paper cups. Styrofoam is inherently terrible for the environment, so we have moved to still terrible for the environment things, but just different. So in this reaction, we use two styrofoam cups because it contains the heat in the reaction better. The reason, so if you go to Starbucks, they give you that sleeve for a couple of reasons. One, you don't burn your fingers, but if you use two cups, it will keep the hot coffee hotter longer. So we're gonna use two when you do the reaction because this air gap, and it's not very big, basically prevents the heat transfer from your hands carrying the cups around in the lab. So inside of this coffee cup calorimeter, we have a couple of things. We have a lid on it because we're going to measure the change in temperature in this solution. 
So we'll make sure it's not heating or cooling the environment. We have a thermometer. It makes sense. How else will we measure change in temperature? This image uses a glass stir, which is a byproduct from, I kid you not, like the 70s. I've never seen one. We're going to use a stir bar here, you know, in the 20th century. Basically, you're going to do this reaction on a magnetic plate. It will spin inside, provided you don't poke a hole in everything else. And so when this happens, what we're going to do is we are going to measure the change in temperature for the reaction using our thermometer. That's going to happen inside the coffee cup. Now, in lab, you're going to see a couple things. You will dissolve different solutions in water and see what happens. You will mix together an acid and a base and see what happens. Or you can mix together two chemical solutions and see the change in temperature for a reaction occurring. We're going to think about all of this. But before we do, we want to think about how we can use these in calculations. So if you remember back, I don't remember when I said these words in class, but in the recent past, the first law of thermodynamics is that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. So in that case, the change in temperature of the water is directly related to the reaction. So the total change in energy for the system, or the change in heat, is going to be zero. So zero equals Q solution plus Q reaction. Now, most of the time we're going to ask you to calculate Q reaction. So Q reaction equals negative Q of the solution. There is a third part of this where it is Q calorimeter, basically how much heat is lost to the calorimeter for the purposes of Gen Chem 1 in lecture. This is a perfect system, it does not exist. In lab, it definitely exists, so like you'll need that as part of your calculations. But in here, all of the heat that comes from the reaction is directly transferred to the water. Now, in our little beaker or coffee cup, we have we got some water, in this case, drawn as blue circles. And we have our reaction. In this case, we're going to have some sort of green spheres. When we put the thermometer in, the thermometer basically reads the temperature of the water. So this is our thermometer. And it measures the water. Because it is physically impossible for you to put the thermometer on a chemical. The water is all around, so we can use it on air. I promise we're getting somewhere very important. Feels like we're just going on an adventure. We are. Oh, it's a good adventure. So Q solution is the temperature of the water. So as the water temperature increases, Q reaction, the heat goes from that system into the others. To calculate Q reaction, it's negative M C sub S of water, delta T of the water. If you were to write this out where it's, the reason it is negative is because we are measuring the temperature of the water. Now, if all I did was make your brain hurt, which is possible, we're going to work some reactions, see if we can't work that out. You can continue to use the Q equals M C sub S delta T. But you need to maintain the knowledge that Q reaction is different than the change in temperature of the water. Basically, when it asks for what sign it should be, this will give you the right answer. Otherwise, it's 50-50 shot that it's positive or negative, and you will have to figure that out. Which is a valid option. Personally, I like my calculation to tell me the answer before I need to know. But that's a me choice. You can choose differently. So the number one question is, but well, how do I know which one to use? Because I showed you Q equals MC sub S delta T and Q equals negative MC sub S delta T. So this has pretty much two hallmarks. One, 
It is a reaction. Which, I say that and you're like, oh, already? But if we think about the previous two examples, the heat of octane and water, both of those where we were heating a solution of one thing. You could not write a reaction for this process or for octane. You just heated it up or did it. So it is a reaction. Now it might be a reaction that we don't tend to think about, but you could write one. And two, C sub S is not a water. Water, and it is more than water. So this says C sub S is water, and it's more than water. If, so the two examples are going to be an acid-base neutralization where you mix acid and base together, and the other one is a dissolution. <clears throat> the specific heat capacity of water is different than everything in the system. So in the example we're about to look at, a student is gonna to mix together hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide. That qualifies as it is a reaction. You could write a chemical reaction for that. But C sub S is out of water, which is provided at the end, but that solution has protons, chloride ions, hydroxide units, and sodium in it. So a more accurate example would be if you had the specific heat capacity of that water solution. But we don't, so we're gonna use this value. Questions before we look at our first example? How many of your brains are a little mushy after that? I'm sorry. <laughs> we are going to, after we work some of these examples, it will make more, I don't want to call it conceptual sense, but you'll be able to clearly tell the difference. So in our first example, a student mixes out together 50 milliliters of one molar HCl and sodium hydroxide in a coffee cup calorimeter. The temperature increases from 21.0 to 27.5. Calculate the enthalpy change, delta H, for the reaction in kilojoules per mole HCl. The total volume is 100 mils. The density is 1.0 gram per mil, and the specific heat is 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. If this question were be, to be presented on an exam, it would say, like, using the specific heat capacity of water, because maybe you're not immediately like 4.184. That is water. I also probably wouldn't have written it this way, but I've pilfered this one from somewhere else. So, the number one thing you guys do is oh, panic. So, the way we leave panic land in this type of a question is you write down all the things that you can find in the problem. Because then at least, instead of just jumping into a calculation, you could say like, oh, okay. Well, here's what we know. Here's what we could do with that information. So in this case, we are going to use Q equals at negative M C sub S delta T. So in this case, the mass can be calculated from the water. So it is 100 mils multiplied by the one gram and one mil Density, so that gives us 100 grams. C sub S, here all the problem. 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. Delta T is final minus initial, so 27.5 minus 21.0, and that gives us 6.5 Kelvin. So now we just plug all of this information into our equation. So we're going to get negative 100 grams times 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin multiplied by 6.5 Kelvin. Shoot, run off space. We'll just stick it over here. And then I'm going to go ahead and convert that into kilojoules because it asks for it. Which I would have preferred to put at the end, but space. So when we plug this into our calculator, we get negative 2.7 kilojoules. 
So this gives us Q. The question asks for the enthalpy change for the reaction in kilojoules per mole HCF. So we hopefully remember that Q of a reaction at constant pressure is directly related to H. So delta H of a reaction is equal to Q at constant pressure. This tiny p basically just means that constant pressure. So is this the final answer? What units is this question asking for? Kilojoules per mole. Okay. So the number one thing that students do is they're like, oh, ice, delta H equals negative 2.7 kilojoules. Oh, I need a per mole. And they just drop a per mole and hope for the best. So in this case, it's important for us to, one, that would be wrong. Let's just start with that. Because you just assumed that this number of kilojoules came from a whole mole of reaction. So we need to figure out how many kilojoules per how many moles. So we can use the molarity and the volume of the hydrochloric acid. So we know that we have 50 mils, which is 0.05 liters, multiply by a 1.0 mole in one liter of solution. So we get 0 0.05 moles. So we can divide by the 0 0.050 moles. And this gives us a delta H of negative 54 kilojoules per mole. Questions? Let me move out of the way so those of you over here can see. Yeah? Uh, why is this negative one kilojoule or one liter? Mm, that is because I could not get the unit conversion on the other side, but the equation is negative. Ordinarily, this would be back here, but I could not, <clears throat> I didn't plan far enough ahead, so I stuck it at the beginning in order to get it in kilojoules. But the equation is negative mc sub s delta t because it's a reaction. Other, no other, hmm? well, let's see how we really feel about this. This is an example. When a 6.5 sample of solid sodium hydroxide dissolves in 100 grams of water in a coffee cup calorimeter, the temperature rises from 21.6 to 37.8 degrees Celsius. Calculate delta H in kilojoules per mole of the sodium hydroxide for the solution process, which is solid sodium hydroxide dissolves into sodium or aqueous sodium ions plus hydroxide ions. Assume that the specific heat of the solution is the same of that of pure water. I'm happy to answer questions as you guys give this. Give it your best go. Use the information presented on the board to assist. I'll give you three or four minutes.
When it's the heat, change in heat for the reaction is different than the change in heat for anything. So you use the non-negative if it is not a reaction. So if you're just, I don't know where you would encounter molten sodium hydroxide. It doesn't really exist. But if you were just changing the heat of that, molten sodium hydroxide is kind of what we put in here. So if you have a block of iron. Then you need Q equals M C to that plus two. When you mix them together, it's negative. How's it going? Are we done? Are we done-ish? We are not done. I mean, that's half the battle. I'm going to go ahead and erase this so that I can write here in just a second. this problem on Wednesday or something, I don't, it will not be exactly like this, but quite similar. One of the things that happens is you read it and then you immediately panic. And so the first thing you should do is write down all the information out of the problem. I like to write it on the right side so I have more space for work. That's me. You can do it anywhere you want. Because if you are making poor assumptions, <laughs> I can see where your logic is if you just multiply a bunch of random things together without units or information. I can't really help you with partial credit. So in this case, we have M, C sub S, and delta C. C sub S comes out of the problem, 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin. Delta T is pretty simple. It's going to be T final minus T initial. And so in this case, it will be 16 0.2 Kelvin. Now, the mass in coffee cup calorimetry or any calorimetry, it's the total mass. So the mass of the water matters. So in the previous problem, we had two 50 ml solutions that we added together. In this case, our mass is going to be 100 grams for the water plus 6.5 grams for the sodium hydroxide. And that gives us 106.5 grams. So now to calculate the Q reaction, it's just negative M C sub S delta T. We have negative 106.5 grams times 4.18 joules per gram Kelvin multiplied by 16.2 Kelvin. And that, in this case, is going to give us negative 7,211.7 joules. So it turns out that this asks for that in kilojoules per mole of sodium hydroxide. Now, the mass of sodium hydroxide is important independent of that of the water. So we're going to take our 6.50 grams of NaOH. And then we're going to use the molecular weight of 40.00 grams in one mole to determine 0 0.1625 moles. From here, we're going to take our negative 7211.7 joules, divide that by our, our mole, uh, moles, sorry. 16.25 moles. And then we're going to convert that into kilojoules, so 1,000 joules and 1 kilojoule. And that gives us negative 44.4 kilojoules per mole.
What questions do we have about this calculation? Yeah. That's the molecular weight. It is 40 grams, right? Thank you. Somebody asked that earlier, and I was like, yeah, with confidence, but double check that. Yeah. So we didn't like that thing with the equation, right? So you just all the information was like. Nope, that was just information that you. It helps you know that it's Q reaction, not just the specific heat of a solution, though. Yeah. Uh, can you say that a little bit louder? This came from converting the 6.5 grams of sodium hydroxide to moles. Other, yeah. Yes. You can, you could, if you were like, you know what, she's always going to ask for it in kilojoules. You could always convert your specific heat capacity into kilojoules and use it from there. That will, that would also work. You could convert at any number of places. In this case, I did it at the end. Other questions? The key points of these. One, is it a reaction? Two, total mass. In order to run this calculation, because you're measuring the heat of the water, it matters what the total mass of this solution is. In this case, it's the mass of the water plus the sodium hydroxide. So, bomb calorimetry. We are going to briefly talk about this. Is it okay if I erase this? Yeah, nobody's screaming, don't do it. So, bomb calorimetry is the assay by which we can determine whether or not, basically, how much heat is required to dispose of something. So, I forgot to put the figure up there. So a bomb calorimeter looks a little bit different than a coffee cup calorimeter. One, it is a fully closed system. It's inside a little box. You have water. You're going to have a thermometer. You're going to have a, in this case, I will again draw the stirring rod. Most people would just throw a stir bar in there. So the reason you need a stir bar is so that the heat dissipates evenly throughout the entire solution. Otherwise, you will end up with hot and cold pockets. And you hope that your thermometer is in a place where it can read near the reaction or elsewhere. So then we're going to use an electric starter. And our sample is in here. So. Coffee cup calorimetry is at constant pressure because you're going to do it on the bench top. So it's very unlikely that the pressure in the environment is going to change. Bomb calorimetry is constant volume. The reaction happens in this space. And so what happens is we take a, an electric current and you basically, in the presence of oxygen, more often than not, explode this. So it is called bomb calorimetry because it functions similarly to a bomb, that it explodes, things are burned up. And then we can measure the temperature here. So Q reaction in this case is directly, it is more intimately tied to the heat of the calorimeter, basically how well the heat transferred from this box to the thermometer and other ways. So bomb calorimetry Calorimetry is actually not on, we will not be working examples or looking at it in Alex, so this is mostly for like general knowledge. So for the next couple of moments, because that's the end of the material for the midterm, what questions do we have about anything we've talked about today? Things that you've seen on Alex where you're like, can you give me information about this? Someone asked me to post a, an old equation sheet from a final so that you guys can see the information. It will look a lot, 
it's actually going to look better than the old ones because it turns out I used to like, they just look terrible in the olden days. The new ones look much better. You will get an equation sheet and a constant sheet periodic table and the activity series on Wednesday like we did for the last one. Yeah? Mm -hmm. if there's, I'm not going to hide any of those things. The only thing that's probably not on there is like the equation for density because it's not an equation and the equation for molarity is not. Those are more concepts, not equations. Any questions about calorimetry? You guys don't usually have questions, so I feel like I should like do more. In that case, I'm going to stop the recording. Oh, we have a question. We'll not stop the recording. reaction, usually you are provided two different masses. And you need to always add those together. You're, it's always the total mass when it's Q reaction. When it is if, so in Alex they will ask you, they like to do, these two things come together. Alex likes to ask, which I think is great. I mean, I don't want to you. If we have a beaker of water, they will heat up a thing of iron and put it inside the water. And then they will tell you Ti for the water and Ti for the iron. This is actually not Q reaction, but it uses a similar concept where the heat of the iron is equal to the negative heat of the water. So in this case, if you have some mass, M1 and M2, you would end up with M of the iron, C sub S of the iron, delta T, because it's going to ask you to solve for the final temperature, equals negative M of the water, C sub S, water, delta T. And then it will ask you to solve for the final temperature. In this case, you can't add them together. You just need to set them equivalent to one another. Where this goes wrong is if you don't assign the negative sign to the right side because the heat leaves one and goes to the other. So you just need to assign one. And if you have a hot iron block and cold water, the T final should be somewhere between those two. So if you assign it incorrectly, it will basically say like you dropped hot iron into cold water and it got like way, way, way hotter. That would be how you would set those up. And that's the only time where you're provided two masses that you don't add. You know, I haven't really finished writing that. Turns out I wrote the chapter one and two stuff and so that I can answer you, but when I sat down to write it, I wasn't sure how far we would get, and so I opted to just leave chapter five alone until we finish today. Other, any other questions? 